Thank you. Um, thanks uh, to the organisers for inviting me um, to be part of this brilliant event. It's a privilege to speak amongst such big names um, and to contribute to the discussion on Schoon. Um, so where did the Scots make their monarchs? The obvious answer is, of course, Schoon, and the famous Stone of Destiny undoubtedly comes to mind. Um, but in many ways, the truth is far more complicated. From the 13th century to 1651, the inaugurations and coronations of Scottish monarchs actually took place in five different settings, and the stone itself only featured in three of the 17 ceremonies across this time period. Schoon certainly dominated throughout the 13th and 14th centuries, as well as long before the date range under consideration here. And the first section of this paper will discuss the importance of Schoon as a place of inauguration, touching at some points on some of the things that Oliver's already talked about this morning, and the unique style of Scottish ceremony which de developed at this ancient inaugural site. However, Schoon's tr don uh, dominance as such a centre waned following the murder of James I at Perth in 1437, and subsequently four other additional sites were used as settings for making Scottish monarchs during the 15th, 16th and 17th centuries. The second part of the paper then will therefore consider the possible motives for such decisions in regards to ceremonial setting, including the return to Schoon in both 1488 and 1651. As an ancient site of inauguration and meeting place for the dispensing of justice, Schoon was Scotland's premier ceremonial site, as already discussed, and as such received, has received far more attention than many other ceremonial sites in Scotland in recent years. For many of the medievalists and others in the audience today, the best-known inaugural event a ceremony to take place at Schoon was that of Alexander III in 1249. This is the only medieval Scottish inaugural event to be blessed with both relatively detailed chronicle accounts and a pictorial record. The Schoon seal um, is uh, contemporary to the reign of Alexander III, and the illustration here comes from a 15th century Scottish chronicle by Walter Bower. As such, it's hardly surprising the events of July 1249 and the sources that record them have been deconstructed and put through their paces on numerous occasions by a range of notable individuals, including Archie Duncan and Dovit Brun. And a relatively clear picture, for a medieval coronation that is, um, of what occurred has emerged from this. However, while the discussions of Schoon as an inaugural site in the 13th century are relatively rich, considering the site consistently hosted royal inaugurations and coronations until the 15th century, there has been little scholarship um, exploring the continued use of the ceremonial space. Subsequently, the relative prominence of the two distinct indoor and outdoor spaces and what, can be, what these can indicate about the political tensions and development of kingship in the ceremonies that occurred there has not been fully investigated. In or prior to the 13th century, developments in the inaugural ceremony at Schoon saw a purely outdoor ceremony become one that combined indoor and outdoor spaces at the Abbey. Walter Bower's description of the inauguration of Alexander III in 1249 in the Scottish Chronicon separates the two cer ceremonies into two sections. Duncan has proposed that the first section of the ceremony, including the girding with the sword by the Bishop of St Andrews and the blessing and ordination, ordination, took place inside the Abbey Church. From here, as Oliver was mentioning earlier, the king was led outside, up the hill through the cemetery, um, to the elevated position of Moot Hill, to his traditional secular enthronement, an act which was, in which the ecclesiastics appear not to have been heavily involved. The direct interaction of William I, Alexander III's grandfather, with the ecclesiastically dominated English ceremony, combined with Scotland's growing papal interactions, including the special daughter status, um, papal gifts, and attempts in the reign of Alexander II to gain the right of unction, give the requisite grounds for stating that, that, that it was during the 13th century that um, the move to a more substantial part of the ceremony within the church had occurred. Nevertheless, the ceremony did remain in two distinct parts, with a still strong secular dominance of the proceedings prior to the granting of unction in 1329, as found in Ireland, where this right was ultimately never granted. A closer investigation of the remaining sources for the ceremonies held at Schoon after 1249 revealed that the distinct separation of place between the secular enthroning and the religious ceremony continued in quite a unique and distinctly Sc Scottish manner even after the introduction of anointing in the 14th century. 
While Robert II and Robert III's coronations, respectively, in 1371 and 1390, saw the extension of this combined ceremony over two and then three days, the distinction of the two spaces for the ceremonial elements remained important. We have no surviving order of ceremony for the Scottish coronation of this era. Financial records suggest that one may have been compiled for David II's ceremony in 1331, but all that remains of this document is a fleeting reference to its creation. Kinlock suggested um, that it was indisputable that, open quote, the majestic ritual of Western Christendom was undertaken for Robert II, close quote. He does not provide any references for this, for the source of this information. However, the ritual that he then proceeds to describe, um, it, from the ritual he then proce proceeds to describe, it's likely that he based his account on the order of Charles V, which is circa 1364. It has been argued that a working copy of this beautiful manus manuscript was held by the Bishop of Glasgow, um, Walter de Wardlaw, who was present at the coronation in 1371, and that it was likely that this document was used in the planning of the, co planning of the ceremony. The ordeans that survived from France and England that may have been accessible to Robert II demonstrate that comparative coronation ceremonies had grown to involve numerous elements, including pre-coronation um, sorry, including pre-coronation processions, late-night vigils, prayers, and preparations undertaken by the king prior to his coronation. As such, this coronation ceremony was becoming a more extravagant representation of sacral monarchical power illuminating Jacques de Goff's st suggestion that royal consecration was so much more than mere inauguration. Whether directly influenced by Charles V's order or not, the Scottish ceremony in 1371 was certainly expanding and developing in unison with European counterparts. However, Robert II's two-day ceremony still divided the first day's religious and divine elements held inside the church from a second day of ceremony that was centred around the king enthroned outdoors to receive the homage and fealty of his people. The extant records of the coronation parliament, which were referred to earlier by Oliver, reveal this clear separation of events across two days and across two familiar locations, the first inside the church and the second outside. This divide between it, inner and outer spaces continues to distinctly separate secular from divine. It's possible that this separation was specifically designed to restrict access to the divine ceremony to the privileged few, leaving the public crowd to view only the secular ceremony. However, considering the continued desire of Scottish kings to remain accessible well into the 16th century, it's also equally possible that for many of the Scottish nobles and even the king, the open air and accessible nature of the secular enthronement um, emphasised its importance. In the case of Robert II and Robert I before him, acceptance of their royal status as the first of their dynasty was crucial and the continued centrality of the outdoor homage ceremony emphasises the understanding that they, these recently royal individuals had of the need for a very public acceptance of their status by the secular nobility from whom they had emerged as leader. Therefore, while the divine status of the king was increasingly rising in the coronation agenda in Scotland, particularly after the papal bull allowing anointing in 1329, the secular, secular enthronement in its outdoor setting retained equal, if not superior, importance during the 14th century. It's important to briefly note that Schoon's prominence as an inaugural site often masks the recognition of its other significant roles, as Oliver mentioned, Schoon was a prominent assembly, assembly site, particularly for the dispensing of justice, from long before the time period being considered here, and I think Matthew Hammond will be covering this um, in far more detail later. Um, Schoon also rose to prominence as a place for parliaments in conjunction with neighbouring Perth, particularly under the early Stuarts, um, up to about 1437. In the reign of Robert II, of the seven parliaments and councils with extant records prior to 1384 when his son was made lieutenant, four of them are held at Schoon and one in neighbouring Perth. And all declarations regarding succession during Robert II's reign that remain extant also took place in these parliaments at Schoon. The combining of the ceremonial space with the mechanics of government was further cemented through Robert II's choice of Schoon as a burial site. 
the centra centralising of governance and the ceremonies of death and succession at Schoon under Robert II can be compared to similar centralising that occurred in England around Westminster under the Plantagenets, particularly Edward I. However, the addition of Robert II's funeral to the coronation of his son essentially created a four-day ceremony event, ceremonial event unlike anything found elsewhere, with the funeral on the Saturday, followed by Robert III's coronation the following day, Annabella Drummond's coronation as Queen on the Monday, and concluded on Tuesday the 16th of August with the giving of fealty ceremony. A clearer delineation of the path from the death of the father to the succession of the son could not have been produced, and the use of this highly politicised ceremonial space demonstrates the early Stuart understanding of projecting a facade of stability, even when such thing was far from the truth in 1390. The coronation and unction of Robert III took place within the Abbey Church, and not one but two bishops were clearly involved. <coughs> There is a notable change in the available records for 1390 in that the ecclesiastical figures are brought to the foreground and any secular involvement appears limited. The power struggle between the king and his brother, Robert, Earl of Fife and, Fife and Lieutenant of the Realm, undoubtedly saw the ceremonial importance of this prominent Earl downplayed. Although Robert III's position as heir was not officially under threat, Fife's lieutenancy was confirmed in May 1390 prior to the coronation, and the tussles over power undoubtedly increased the delay between Robert III's death in April and the joint funeral and coronation in August. Additionally, for the first time in 1390, the Church intruded on the secular giving of fealty before the enthroned king, as Thomas, Bishop of Galway, gave a, a right pleasant sermon after the homage ceremony on the final day. Yet this ceremony was still given its own day in the proceedings, and with the ceremony occurring in August, it's highly likely, though unfortunately not confirmed, that this predominantly secular ceremony took place outside. When the location of the coronation began to vary in the late 15th and 16th centuries, the distinction between the secular and the divine was blurred further by the combining of these two prominent coronation elements within one indoor ecclesiastical space. In 1437, following the murder of James I in Perth, the young king, aged six, was rapidly moved to Edinburgh Castle after his father's burial and James II's coronation occurred in Holyrood Abbey in Edinburgh. This sudden break in tradition was undoubtedly spurred by fears for young James II's safety in the brief period in which the widowed queen, Joan Beaufort, held a distinct amount of power, at least over her son. However, within these, new, within these new ecclesiastical settings, there was elements of the ceremony that seemed to have been designed to uphold traditional distinctions between private and public, as well as secular and divine. <coughs> the only account of the coronation at Holyrood is found in 17th century heraldic collection of Sir James Balfour of Den, Den Mill. And there are certainly reasons why this account must be used with caution, including the fact that it inaccurately records it as the coronation of Robert II. Um, however, Roderick Lyle argues that the document copied by Balfour originated from the mid-15th century canons of Holyrood, creating historical precedents for the coronation of James II. If this were the case, the coronation of 1437 would have been the most recent coronation in memory as well as being the only pre-Union monarch's coronation to have occurred at Holyrood. Therefore, there's reason to suggest that this ceremony, the description of this ceremony was formed, formed the basis of this account. The opening line, which starts before the king came in public, suggests that the ceremony was split into, private and, into a private and a public ceremony. And this division is then emphasised further in the need for the royal genealogy to have been recited twice at, at different stages in the ceremony. While the role of the secular earls seems to have been reduced to swearing fealty, secular officials received heightened importance in this ceremony, including the hereditary constable and marshal and the Lord Lion King of Arms, who rise to prominence in 1437, certainly has roots in the absorption of the Earl of Earldom of Fife by the Crown in 1425, which left the ceremonial gap to be filled as the Earl of Fife held a key role in the outdoor enthronement. 
It's also um, important to point out that the hereditary constable and marshal were both raised to earldoms during the reign of James II once he was an adult, perhaps to add landed title gravitas to the official roles in the wake of their increased ceremonial duties. As the whole ceremony in 1437 took place within the church, the enthronement and giving of homage took place indoors. However, the document also refers to the construction of a raised platform for the king and his throne. The English influence acting upon the Dowager Joan Beaufort could account for these changes, as the English order of ceremony records a raised platform. But there are other reasons for this decision. For example, it could be argued that the stage within the Abbey Church featured for the purpose of raising the king physically above his people to replicate the, to replicate the elevated outdoor site at, at the Moot Hill. The 15th century move to house the entire ceremony indoors was also matched by a rise in prominence of the city-centric processional arrival and departure of the monarch from their coronation. In 1437, James II was led out of Edinburgh Castle, where the coronation parliament was already underway, through the borough of, to, the, to Holyrood Abbey amidst cheers of the people of Edinburgh. Therefore, there was still a keen desire for a public element to the coronation proceedings, despite the enclosing of the coronation within an ecclesiastical space. Through the 16th century, there was a continuing privatising of the ceremony, particularly for the two ceremonies which occurred within Stirling Castle for James V in 1513 and Mary in 1543, where the procession travelled from the royal residence to the chapel royal or within the castle enclosure. Such a choice may in fact just have been symptomatic of the ever decreasing age of the monarchs being um, enthroned in Scotland. After all, James V, Mary and James VI were all raised to the throne before they were 18 months old. Therefore, as with the choice of Holyrood in 1437, this choice appears to have been rooted in issues of safety and convenience the choice of the place and setting of the coronations in the 16th century appears to also have revolved, revolved around increasing focus on Stirling as one of two royal centres alongside Edinburgh. More particularly for the coronations of these infants, as Stirling developed a role as a home for minor monarchs prior to their full entrance to the political arena, a political moment that was increasingly marked in the 16th century by elaborate entry processions into Edinburgh. The final setting that must be mentioned fits absolutely no pattern at all. Um, in 1460, following the death of James II during the Siege of Roxburgh, Mary of Gelders brought her nine-year-old son from Edinburgh to Kelso, the closest abbey to the siege site, to be crowned as James III. The ceremony at Kelso is something of a mystery, both in terms of the ceremony that actually occurred there and the reasons behind the choice. One element that certainly occurred was a post-coronation knighting ceremony in which a hundred individuals were, were dubbed knights. This had become a fairly common feature of Scottish coronations since at least that of David II in the 14th century. Additionally, by bringing the young heir and the great men of government to the siege site, all of them then accompanied the body of James II in an elaborate funeral procession from the borders to Edinburgh for his burial at Holyrood. These suggest an urgent desire of the widowed queen to cement the victory of Roxburgh with the accession of her young son and emphasise the dynastic passing of power between father and son. In this, her own experience of succession from Gelders and Burgundy may well have influenced her. Parti <coughs> In Gelders particularly, the succession was apt to crisis. Her own father's succession had rested on, the ele on election by the towns and knightly classes, and in 1460, at the same time as this coronation was happening, her brother, supported by the Duke of Burgundy, was fighting her father for control of the duchy. The pertinent point here, however, is, is not the unusual choice of Kelso Abbey in 1460, but the fact that the ceremony moved at all. The fact that Scotland had no permanent place of coronation after 1424 is curious, particularly when compared with England, where the site of coronation had been firmly fixed from the 11th century at Westminster, with the only deviation being Henry III, who was first crowned at Gloucester in 1216 for safety reasons. And France, where, again, Notre Dame Cathedral in Rams took the role of coronation church from the 11th century, 
with only two deviations for Louis VI crowned in Orléans in 1108 and the coronation of Henry VI of England as the King of France in charters in 1431. One variable that has not been given due attention in the, context, in the Scottish context has to be who organised these ceremonies. From 1214 to 1424, all the Scottish coronations were organised either by adult monarchs or by Scottish-born nobles and clerics left in charge of young monarchs. It was after 1424 and James I's active promotion of his foreign-born wife, Joan Beaufort, in the political sphere that the change of settings began to occur. Joan did not retain political power for very long after her husband's death, but she pursued her husband's murderers and was proactive in the ceremonial choices regarding the burial of her husband, and that this included attempts to have him raised as a Christian martyr, and the coronation of her son. Mary of Gelders was a prominent and powerful figure in politics during her husband's lifetime, but crucially from, her, from his death in 1460 until her own in 1463. Margaret Tudor, wife of James IV, like Joan, struggled to retain political power, but was in charge of her son during the first year of his reign. And Mary de Guise, the most long-standing political force of all these widowed queens, was certainly heavily involved in the coronation of her daughter in 1543, paying for items for the coronation from her own personal wealth. These women undoubtedly influenced these ceremonies and perhaps key to understanding the shifts in the coronation settings. To further support these suggestions, we can look at the two occasions when the coronation returned to Schoon after 1424. In 1488, James IV was 15 years old and he placed as a figurehead of a campaign that ended in the murder of his father. The decision to return, the ancient inaugural, return to the ancient inaugural site was made by the Scottish noble clique who instructed the young king's actions. His mother had predeceased his father in this instance. In an attempt to legitimise both the king's position and the position of his, of his noble clique alongside him. In 1641, uh, 1651, sorry, when Charles II was crowned at Schoon, this was again a choice of Scottish elites, this time retaliating to the English execution of Charles I. The only coronations which are left out of this analysis are those of James VI in 1567. He was crowned at the Church of Ho the Holy Rood in Stirling by Protestant nobles amidst a civil war while the, trying to emphasise a distinct break from Catholic tradition and that of Charles I in 1633, who toyed with the idea of being crowned at Schoon, but this was one of a number of su the suggestions made by Scots, which was ignored by Charles, Charles I, and he was ultimately crowned at Holyrood. However, the circumstances around these two events allow them to be considered, I, I would argue, as extraordinary exceptions to any rules that can be presented about coronation settings. To conclude then, it's clear that the physical setting of Schoon was a prominent factor in the development of the unique coronation ceremony in Scotland, through the continued separation of the ecclesiastical and secular, secular ceremonial spaces in a manner that emphasised the distinctive nature of the Scottish medieval kingship and its relation to the polity of the three estates. However, the unfortunate consistency of early violent deaths of monarchs in the 15th and 16th centuries caused a change in the dynamics of power, the subsequent increased involvement of foreign queen consorts who had differing concerns, priorities and cultural backgrounds must be taken into account when analysing why the Scottish coronation site became so fluid and changeable, uh, such a fluid and changeable part of the ceremony. The consistency of important traditional elements of the ceremony touched upon here, and in much greater detail in my thesis, if anyone would like to refer to it, um, such as the prominence of the recitation of the genealogy and the oath of fealty to the enthroned king, demonstrate that despite these influences, there was a significant continued involvement from the Scottish estates within the design of the ceremonies of minors, not suggesting that the queens took complete control. However, it, it appears ultimately that the traditional setting of Schoon was one aspect over which they were unable, unable to retain or willing to relinquish control. Thank you.